All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the show. Adjust this camera a little bit. Hope you're all doing well. It's Friday. <laughs> Something to celebrate about. Today is January 6th. It is a Friday all day long, which is fantastic going into a weekend. Welcome to episode number 276 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Lozier, and over the next 45 minutes, me, you, and all a chat will be bringing the hottest, newest, most relevant cybersecurity news stories of the day, and I'll be providing my expert analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner or if you're looking to operationalize it. Uh, excuse me. If you're a practitioner and you're looking to operationalize it, I'll help you with that. If you're looking to break into the industry, a lot of the terminology we'll be using, it's good for context. Um, and plus, in any interview, you're going to be asked, how do you stay current? Um, this is a fantastic answer. Shout out to anybody who's new. I saw C Money up in, up in chat. And always, what's up to all the squad members who are here on the regular? What's up, Philip Muga, Jamie, Chris Kane, Duke Norris, my man, Zombie Guy, Justin's always in here on the regular. Guys, before we get into the news and dig into it, I do want to say shout out and love to the stream sponsors, starting with my good friend Eric Taylor over at Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions, they know how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. They know how to work with threat actors. They know how to basically put the fire out if your business is on fire. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. This is the Barricade Cyber website. Uh, the most, you know, there's a lot of great information here, but probably the most important part is right here. This is Eric Taylor's calendar. You can literally just get on his calendar as early as uh, 11.30 a.m. Eastern today to talk to him about your business, your business needs, set you up for success in the event that you experience, unfortunately, some type of gnarly incident that you don't want to deal with. Also, shout out and love to Recon InfoSec, Eric Capuano, Whitney Champion, and the whole group over there. Also, the folks who run Thursday Defensive, if you've been part of that scene uh, on Thursdays, great, great initiative. If you're in need of a service that provides your org with 24-7 managed detection and response, MDR services, you need Recon InfoSec, guys. Their transparent offering includes the people, process, and technology needed to deliver full-spectrum security operations to organizations of any size. Okay, 10-person, 20-person, 1,000-person. It scales very nicely. Recon InfoSec provides direct access to their team of analysts, engineers, architects, fully managed SIM and SOAR. You get the whole stack, right? And unlike many, you know, kind of larger commodity MDR providers, um, that offer big promises, little value. Recon MDR takes a security first approach that provides real answers and effective defense. We had um, Jess Bishop, Stacey Loki on yesterday, SOC analyst who work the night shift right now. A great stream if you're interested or want to know more about SOC analyst work. Uh, is night shift cool? Is it? I don't know. Go watch that stream last night. Wicked informative. It was lots of Q&A. But they don't work at Recon InfoSec, but Recon InfoSec has people who do similar work. And that's what I'm saying with this. Like if you wanted to speak directly to the analyst handling the issue or whatever, you could do that, which is very, very valuable if you're director of InfoSec or CISO or whatever, and you need answers because the executives are up your butt about what the hell, what is going on. You, This is how you get it, right? Okay. So I do want to remind everybody that each episode, oh, reconinfosec.com, links in the description below. I think there's a link that has like some type of Simply Cyber tag associated with it so they know you came from me, but I I don't really care about that. Just check out Recon Infosec if you want legitimate MDR services, okay? Each episode, hey, see money, you may not know this because you're new here. Each episode, like this one of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE. So if you have CISP, CISA, system certifications galore, uh, check the policies for certification requirements, but most of them will accept this type of webinar effectively as legitimate uh, because that's what we're doing here. So be sure to say what's up in chat so you can document that you were here, basically like roll call. Same for my team replay people, hashtag team replay in the comments, add a little editorial if you will. I see people do that all the time and I love it. It's always fun to read. If you are live, I do love that too. Thanks so much for being here. 123 of you, 128 of you uh, getting in here. 
We got a great show. I will be revealing later today what the raffle is. We'll be raffling prizes off all next week, so you'll want to catch that. Don't worry, Team Replay. I've got you in mind. Thursday will be Team Replay's raffle day where we'll uh, we'll do an asynchronous raffle uh, to make sure that you guys get um, consideration. Now, that's the script. Let me say hi for just a minute to uh, Team Live. Uh, I, I am being uh, conscientious to move most of the jaw jacking to the back end of the stream so the people who are just here for the news uh, can bounce out and we can have a good time. But I do want to say what's up to Kerry White, Reggie Davis, Kenny Pena, my man. What's up, Alana? Good to see you. Good day, Masama Musavi. Good to see you, Tom Hathco. 32 likes and counting. Oh, yeah, don't worry. I'll be pandering for likes at the mid roll. Don't sweat that. Revamp your resume, Adam. All right. Thank you, Gary Sturgiatis. Stacy Loki, Jess Bishop, absolutely crushed it last night. I just, I just basically had to get out of their way. Um, they, they had all of the, um, the, they were driving the train. Train was full, full locomotive going on. So it was good things. That's right, TJF, Alex, and BSEC. All right, guys. Let us get into the news. Actually, you know what? This is going to have a nice, clean segue. Fifteen seconds on the audio. So let us. Let us smoothly segue into the news. Guys, sit back, relax. I'll see you guys at the mid-roll, okay? From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. It's Friday, January the 6th, 2023. Slack's private GitHub code repositories stolen over the holidays. The popular Salesforce-owned messaging app is used by an estimated 18 million users at workplaces and digital communities around the world, and this incident involves threat actors gaining access to Slack's externally hosted GitHub repositories via a limited number of Slack employee tokens that were stolen. While some of Slack's private code repositories were breached, Slack's primary code base and customer data remain unaffected, according to the company. There is no indication that sensitive areas of Slack's environment, including production, were accessed. Oh, that's good. Sir. Okay, so check it out. A couple things. One, if you guys don't know Slack, it's like Discord, except it's different, right? And lots of people use it, 18 million people, frankly. I will say, uh, you know, free tidbit Tuesday thing right here. For some reason, like I really like Discord. For some reason, I've never liked Slack. I, and it, it, it's not with like the functionality of Slack. It's with the authentication. I have like like five or six Slack accounts because every time I try to join a new Slack server... Like I have to create a new account somehow and it gets all messed up and it just, I like order and it frustrates the crap out of me. Okay, Joel Belton is a Slack guy. That's fine. Okay, so Slack's private GitHub code repo stolen over the holidays. Cybersecurity Central with the gifted sub. Hey, if you're new here, go up and grab one of those gifted subs. Thanks so much. Um, Kimberly in the Cybersecurity Central team for gifting those. Navina is a new squad member. Kieber is a new squad member. Good, good, good on you. Happy Friday. So <clears throat> the cool thing here is I'm going to call a win on this one. So Slack's private GitHub repos were compromised through um, basically stolen tokens. So users who had access to the GitHub repo, maybe they installed Redline InfoStealer malware or some type of InfoStealer malware um, that sucked up their tokens and threat actors um, basically can use those tokens to appear to be a legitimate user and authenticate, right? This is, this is the trade-off with cloud-based SaaS applications and you know federated ident uh, authentication everywhere and the convenience of not having to log in every single time you do an activity in one of these platforms, right? And it, real, let's be real, like you're not gonna, like if you had to log in every time you did anything um, on Slack, for example, you wouldn't use it anymore because it would just be unbearably uh, full of friction. Now, the one thing that I do wanna point out, and you know, I don't know if you guys saw this as part of the story, but like, Slack noticed um, noticed the unauthorized um, access, right, from a legitimate user, right? So if it was Jerry's token and Jerry logs into the GitHub, it should look legit. But obviously, Slack was running or Microsoft, you know, I, I don't know what their uh, affiliation is as far as like if Slack is a wholly owned subsidiary or something. But basically, the, the SecOps team, right, maybe the MDR team, Managed detection and response. Whoever it was, was watching and was able to discern based on what was happening that this was actually not 
Jerry logging in with Jerry's token into the GitHub repo, but it was actually some type of unauthorized threat actor appearing to be Jerry logging in to the GitHub repo, and they nipped it in the bud. So to me, you know, guys, it's all about cyber resiliency. You're not going to secure anything. You're going to just make it harder to be compromised than when it is. Um, cut down the time of compromise and cut down on the impact of the compromise. And that's what Slack did here. I'm very, very... Um, I'm very, very happy for them, right? They caught it. They they revoked all the tokens, which kicked the, you know, and then kicked the threat actors out. Um, it was only for a limited amount of time that they were in there. And they had the telemetry to see that it did not appear that any type of breach of, of code was copied down or customer data was copied down. So this, to me, this isn't a story about Slack being breached. This is a story about Slack's um, incident response capabilities being top notch. So good on you, Slack. <laughs> CI warns of security breach. Rotate your secrets. Circle CI, a software development service, has disclosed a security incident and is urging users to rotate their secrets. The CI CD platform touts having a user base comprising more than 1 million engineers who rely on the service for speed and reliability of their builds. Circle CI states it is currently investigating a security incident according to email notifications being received by Circle CI users. The secrets that customers are advised to rotate include the ones stored as project, environment variables, or in contexts. For projects using API tokens, Circle CI has invalidated these tokens and users will be required to replace them. Dang, man. I'm seeing a trend today. It's all about those uh, cloud tokens or, you know, whatever SaaS product uh, tokens getting compromised. Again, guys, I don't know if it's like a slow news day or something here, but... Uh, way to go, Circle CI. I'm going to give you some credit here. Guys, anytime... Well, here's what happened. It's a DevOps platform, right? D developer operations that allows quicker um, dev, test, prod workflows. You can, you can commit to codes much quicker. This is the way that software is currently done in 2022, right? Like, this is the correct way. So, Circle CI is a platform that allows you to do that. And <clears throat> secrets are basically, you know, like API codes and... and like things that you do not want disclosed, right? PKI keys, perhaps. So Circle CI noticed an incident, but I want to point out, this is what I like about it. We joke, we joke that um, businesses will always get their pants pulled down and their bottom slapped. And, they'll, and then they'll be like, we take security, like in the letter that they're emailing you about how your data has been compromised. They're like, we take security and privacy very seriously. It's like, do you though? Do you? Um, this right here, I actually like it. They are confident that there are no unauthorized actors in the system. However, out of an abundance of caution, they're asking customers to rotate their keys. This to me is actually an indication of a company that does really take security seriously and privacy seriously. Guys, you got to remember from a business perspective, making the decision to publicly come out and tell and introduce friction basically and erode confidence in your platform from a security perspective to your customer base is a huge decision. You're you're basically like scaring your customers, right? Imagine imagine if you will that like you're at a restaurant, right? Or or a grocery store and and the grocery store like you bought all your groceries and the grocery store sends a letter out and says like, "Hey, like there was like one bad chicken in the entire poultry section. We're not sure which one out of an abundance of caution. Everybody's got to throw their chicken out. Sorry. Right. Like you might be like, dude, I'm not shopping at that rest uh, that, that grocery store anymore. That's bull crap. So the business has to make a deliberate calculation on weighing the decision between upsetting their customer base, eroding confidence, having reputational damage done versus doing the right thing and and being a you know basically walking the walk of what your guiding principles are and what your values are so i i appreciate circle ci doing this i think that obviously our our society has become more um uh, acclimated if you will to situations like this if this was 10 years ago circle ci would be like uh uh <laughs> no we're we're not going to do that because you'd be like the only one out there. But right now, uh, lots of companies are getting breached. People have become desensitized to it. So for Circle CI to say, hey, listen, we don't think there's an issue, but we definitely will know there is zero issue if you rotate your keys, go for it. You know, good on Circle CI. Good. Hey, it's today's the day of uh, businesses doing good stuff for their customers.
NATO tests AI's ability to protect critical infrastructure against cyber attacks. AI can act without human intervention to identify critical infrastructure cyber attack patterns and detect malware to enable enhanced decision making about defensive responses. These are the findings of an international experiment conducted at NATO's Cyber Coalition event late last year. The experimental findings were published in late December shortly after a new U.S. Government Accounting Office report warned that numerous key government entities are flying blind on critical infrastructure security, having failed to implement most recommendations related to protecting critical infrastructure since 2010. Hacker. All right, so the, the aim of this experiment, like basically they had AI, uh, it sounds like AI trying to do SecOps work, okay? <clears throat> Defender SecOps work. The aim of the experiment was to test and measure AI's efficiency in collecting data and assisting teams in responding to cyber attacks against critical systems, highlighting which tools to improve collaboration. Uh, so if you're interested in, um, if you're interested in kind of like SOAR, uh, security orchestration automation, what's the R? Remediation um, with AI to help you. This, this is kind of like a, a, even though the government's doing it right now, private sector security technology companies have been trying to introduce as much automation. Uh, some businesses are actually slowly integrating ChatGPT into their product suite, not to replace it, but basically to enhance uh, the capabilities, right? We saw um, uh, Intizer, like I just, I did a video like last month on Intizer where, you know, they're, they're hooking into EDR platforms and providing like basically uh, triage or tier one analyst uh, work uh, into the ticket automatically. So this is interesting in that regard. I also want to point out that, you know, I get that they're testing it. I get that chat GPT is like, you know, all the rage right now and all the, all, all the, you know, AI bots, but <clears throat> I'm not saying, <clears throat> okay, so tinfoil hat emote, which is why we have it. I'm not like, obviously, and I get flamed on this in the comments section when I start comparing things to movies or whatever, but like, to me, this is like moving slowly into tel uh, Skynet, right? Like where, do you remember in like the, the Terminator Genesis movie or w w the third one, whatever it was, where like the whole, the whole shtick was that like they turned over military defense capabilities to AI uh, because it can move faster and it can make decisions quicker. And that's when AI was like, all right, I'll take it from here, uh, eradicate humans. So I, I'm not saying that's what this is, but basically it seems interesting that they're trying to integrate AI into being able to move faster. And, and it says aid security defenders uh, basically, but with autonomous decision-making and, and just-in-time stuff, we're, we're seeing a little bit of this with drones and uh, dude, I saw a really crazy commercial online of like a drone that's actually like, it's basically like a landmine and a drone and it'll fly around and it'll identify a target. So like, and, and then it'll detonate itself and eliminate the target if you're picking up what I'm putting down. Um, so that's already there. Like basically the soldier in the field just throws the thing like towards the building it wants to eliminate uh, the threat actors in. Obviously, this is a military capability. And then, like, the commercial. Go go watch the commercial. I'll, I'll find it afterwards if you guys want. Um, it's bananas and kind of scary, too. All right. Use CAPTCHA bypass to make 20,000 GitHub accounts in a month. According to Palo Alto Network's Unit 42, a South African threat actor known as Automated Libra is abusing CICD service providers such as GitHub to create many accounts quickly without requiring manual intervention. This is in support of their crypto mining and free jacking activities. To speed the process, the group uses ImageMagic's Convert tool to convert CAPTCHA images into their RGB equivalents and then use the Identify tool to extract the red channel skewness for each image. The value outputted by the Identify tool is used for ranking the images in ascending order. Finally, the automated tool uses the table to select the image that tops the list, which is usually the right one. Okay, okay. So a couple things here. One, uh, I'm glad that they went into the technical details on how the CAPTCHA was being bypassed so people can understand that. But I, I've said this a couple times. I think I like cribbed this from somebody I, else. Like I definitely heard someone else say this before me. So this isn't my original thought. But guys, ChatGPT can like 
write code, ChatGPT can write a short story, can write marketing copy, can correct things, can give you guidance, like can do all these things. Do you really think in 2022 that like a CAPTCHA, like AI couldn't solve a CAPTCHA? Like, bro, you, you, like it's hilarious to me that this is considered an industry standard for stopping stopping threat actors from moving forward. Like the bot, guys, spoiler alert, the bots can pass a captcha okay so you're, you're not this isn't uh satisfactory okay now why would you want to create twenty thousand github accounts well obviously uh when you have massive amounts of accounts under your control on any platform whether it's twitter whether it's github or whatever you can influence and do well you can do a bunch of things but you can definitely influence public opinion right so you could commit some type of malware code base up and then you could promote it out uh, on social media. And then you could have, you know, 20,000 uh, likes or whatever, or like, you know, tons of people contributing to the project, lending itself to a more credible code base, even though it's completely malware, right? So it, you're, you're able to shape it. Same thing with like Twitter or LinkedIn, right? If you had 20,000 accounts, right? You could post something like, oh, here's like the coolest, newest tool, like, or, or that um, stupid Instagram uh, invisible naked filter thing a couple weeks ago. If you don't remember, like Instagram had a stupid challenge or TikTok, whatever, I don't care, had a challenge where like, it's the dumbest thing too. Like you'd get naked and film yourself and the, there'd be a filter that blurs you out. <laughs> so somebody released malware that claimed to remove the blur so you could check out the goods on, on people. Uh, and in reality, it was not removing any filter. It was actually just installing malware on your computer. And then lots of people fell for it. So there's the the playbook. But I mean, if you had 20,000 accounts saying, yeah, this this filter thing to totally works. I love it. I love it. I love it. I got to see all the nudes. More people are going to fall into your trap, right? So that's what's going on here. From a technical perspective, I do appreciate it. Uh, basically what they said was it analyzes the RGB pixel values of a, of, of the captcha and then ranks them in order based on how much red is in them. And then it chooses the top one. I didn't know that. It doesn't make any sense to me why the, why the, the one with the most red would be the thing. Like when they're talking about traffic lights or crosswalks or bicycles, like, you know, it's not, there's not a lot of red going on in there. So I don't really understand all that, but it's clearly working for the threat actors, so be mindful of that. I guess I guess the TLDR here from an operational perspective is if you think that your control of having a CAPTCHA for account creation is the end-all, be-all control preventing malicious um, bot accounts from being created, you're mistaken and you need to review um, your, your process. Let's and get... now a word from our sponsor, App Omni. Did you know that over half of companies have sensitive SaaS data exposed on the public internet? And many breaches making headlines now involve SaaS apps? App Omni can help. App Omni identifies misconfigurations and guides remediation to keep your SaaS data secure. We help security teams make sense of data access permissions, third-party app visibility, and threat detection across their entire SaaS ecosystem. Get started at appomni.com. That's A-P-P-O-M-N-I. Dot com. All right. If you're new here, this is a regular thing, so get ready. All right, everybody, it's the mid roll, so we're going to take a hot minute and do mid roll things as we are prone to do. If you're getting entertainment value out of this stream, if you're getting educational value out of this stream, if you're getting entertainment and educational value, if you're enjoying the networking, take a second, hit the like button. It goes a long way to empowering and enabling YouTube to find other cybersecurity professionals who don't know about this and bring this to them, right? I saw some people see Money9, new person in here this morning. Uh, I'm not sure how they found us, but it might be because of all the likes that we hit yesterday. So genuinely appreciate you taking a second to do that. It helps me. It helps the channel. Special thanks to Barricade Cyber Solutions and Recon InfoSec for continuing to be the stream sponsors and supporting the work that we do here. Guys, it's not too late to sign up for the simplycyber.io slash newsletter. Put this in uh, chat. Every single Monday morning, well, actually every single Saturday, I write an email. But every single Monday, it gets delivered to you. And in the email, it's, it's really no fluff. It's no bullcrap. It's not, there's no ads. It's like literally an actionable email 
something for your end users, something for your peers, something for your executives on like something that you can actionably do and execute on Monday morning before your coffee is cool enough to drink, you will have already delivered cyber risk reduction to your business. I know a lot of people, there's over, I think maybe 3,000 people have signed up for the newsletter, which is fantastic. Um, a lot of people have messaged me. They use the information in different ways. Some of them go right to their end users. Some of them hold meetings. Some of them roll it up and do a monthly, like kind of all call for InfoSec to the organization. However you want to operationalize the data, the point is I give you the raw tool to be able to do something and it doesn't require a lot of refinement, right? Like I, I try to do 90% of the work for you so you guys can do it. So go ahead, sign up, get some of that action. I do want to remind everybody that last night I did have uh, the very excellent Jess Bishop and Stacy Loki on stream. If you didn't catch that uh, video, it's right here. They were awesome. This talk was awesome. We were already planning our uh, part two since we didn't get to, uh, we only got to probably a third of the questions. Um, I'm putting the link in chat. Go ahead and check that out after the stream is over. Uh, also, I, we might, I, are we doing a, a video drop today? Hold on one second, I don't even know. Today is the 10th or 6th. Okay, so I guess the next one's the 10th. All right, so if you haven't uh, been following it, I actually have a video series of any role in the industry to cyber. Uh, I've been doing a whole bunch of them. Yes, I've, <laughs> like an idiot. Uh, what the raffle prize is next week. So hold on. Hopefully you're not seeing buffering issues. Guys, so next week we'll be wrapping. Like, he's a, a black bat. He is into la 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 is going. He also wrote the book on practical social engineering um, toolkit, which the guy's awesome. He's he's made a course called Owen. We're raffling off for Pi to do it. It has been a fantastic experience. So it'll be sick. All right, let's get back to the news. Burger chain Five Guys discloses data breach impacting job applicants. Five Guys appears to have started informing customers on December 29th when it also notified state authorities about this incident. Exposed information includes names, social security numbers, and driver's license numbers. Little information is available about the incident itself. The company said it identified unauthorized access to files on a file server on September. An investigation completed on this contained information submitted to the company in connection with its employment process. All right, so five guys, you know, it's a burger restaurant. They say notifying customers of the incident, but it was their employees or potential employees, right? People who applied. That, that's even more insult to injury. So like you applied to five guys, didn't get the job, and you still had your data breached. Uh, a little annoying that they would even keep that data. I guess you could argue, like, if you apply again, they'll have information on you, but uh, it's kind of sus. Um, it looks like a law firm. No, here's another no surprise. A law firm is trying to round up a bunch of people who are affected to a class action lawsuit. So the law firm can make a ton of money and the people who can make, uh, you know, a free medium French fry. Um, so whatever there's not much here basically exposed file server got compromised it doesn't say s3 bucket uh but you know pick your poison but it probably was something like that an exposed file server all right i'm i'm, I'm hearing that there are buffering issues let me investigate that um give me one hot second here we will investigate oh it's stable now okay so not a big story here five chains uh, five guys suffers the data breach. I do want to say I saw uh, Jeremy Williams' uh, super chat there. Thank you so much, Jeremy. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Uh, it's, Jeremy did ask about when the next office hours are. I'm targeting uh, January 27th right now. Um, on the 13th and the 20th, I actually have uh, personal commitments with family coming into town, so cannot do it those days, but targeting January 27th. Uh, but stay tuned for more information on that. Email addresses of 235 million Twitter users offered on popular hacker forum. Following the leak of 400 million usernames announced in December, a new data leak containing email addresses for 235 million Twitter users has been published on the Breach Hacker Forum. 
According to experts, this data leak does not indicate whether an account is verified, but they warn that the leaked data can be used by threat actors to target the users of platforms for criminal impersonation and doxing activities. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, somebody posted 235 million Twitter users content, and this is like what the what the content was. Okay, so I can't really zoom in anymore. But basically, I'll, I'll just read it to you. It's email address, name. So Gerald at Simply Cyber, name Gerald Osier, screen name at Gerald Osier, number of followers, and the date I created my account. That's the extent of the date, data, right? So it is a huge data trove dump, but you know it's not immediate impact. Like basically, the data can be used to. Uh, be used in a different type of attack, right? Like a phishing attack or social engineering attack or something like that. If I was a threat actor, I mean, you could basically take this, filter by number of followers, have the top ones at the top, and then expect those accounts to either be brand accounts or an email address to get to them. Although I almost think you'd have to pick somewhere in the sweet spot middle because like, or like for whatever reason, or 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 Elon or or Bill Gates or whoever, like, I, I like Bill Gates isn't registered that have people that register accounts and it's probably some generic, um, you know, uh, email address for handling these type of things. So I think you got to kind of find the sweet spot where it's like uh, the actual person's address, email address where you could attack them. If, if that's what you were going to go from uh, prior in this person, the validity of this data dump being new data uh, is in question. The email address you signed up with for Twitter and your Twitter handle you know what I'm saying? It says my network connection is solid. Um, I'm in the studio right now. Um, look at it, guys. Here, I'm still in connection. I, I don't. Database of the CricketSocial.com platform left open online. Cricket Social is a social platform developed services in the U.S. contained admin credentials and private customer data, including email, phone numbers, names, hashed user passwords, dates of birth, and addresses. The experts noticed that most of the records in the database seemed to be test data. However, the experts also discovered it includes some personally identified... All right. I mean, this is a super slow news day, y'all. Uh, Cricket Social which is apparently a social media platform for cricket pe people who enjoy the, the the sport cricket not the arts and crafts tool cricket which they, um had a had a database exposed probably an s3 bucket if i had to guess i'm always throwing the s3 buckets into the into the um uh the what do they call those things what what are the things that um that you like push big trees into and then they come out wood chips on the other side wood chipper i guess I'm always throwing S3 buckets into a wood chipper. Um, guys, a huge trove of data. And they said, you know, upon analysis, it looks like test data. So, like, it, this is like, I mean, you, like, this is the definition of slow news day, y'all, right? Like, literally, a database of a platform that many of us haven't heard of got breached and it was mostly test data. Like, what is the story? Like, what are we doing here? Like, I'm just going to skip this one. Chinese researchers claim to have broken RSA with a quantum computer. Experts aren't so sure. Breaking 2048-bit RSA would be extremely significant. Although the RSA algorithm itself has largely been replaced in consumer-facing protocols such as transport layer security, it is still widely used in older enterprise and operational technology software and in many code signing certificates. The Chinese researcher's paper titled Factoring Integers with Sublinear Resources on a Superconducting Quantum Processor features one of the first claims that this can now be practically achieved. They argue that they can break the 2048-bit algorithm using a 372-qubit quantum computer. There are some caveats, however. They only had access to a 10-qubit device to practice on and were unable to demonstrate their hypothesis on anything larger than 48 bits. Many experts are questioning their findings. The paper itself has been shared through the preprint service Arxiv, A R X I V, without any meaningful peer review, something which would be generally considered a necessary minimum standard to weigh the scientific value of a research paper. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so, you know, oftentimes it, with academic papers, we kind of, you know, uh, joke or whatever. 
uh, not joke, but like, oh, like, you know, the the fact that, you know, you can use a, like researchers have discovered you can use like a drinking straw to uh, like suck up Bluetooth uh, communications and get, you know, c contact info from Android devices, like something, something crazy like that, right? Um, so we usually are like, oh, that's clearly an academic paper. Um, th there's a couple things going on here, okay? So first of all, there's no, qu there's no question that there is a race right now to use quantum computing to crack modern encryption. There's no question. I guarantee you China's working on it. I guarantee you the United States is working on it. I guarantee you several other first world countries with the research capability and the, and the people are working on it. Okay, so let's just put that aside. At the same time, quantum computing's here. Um, they're trying to solve a couple of the problems, like like cool the cooling problem, and um, you know obviously it's not going to be ready for mainstream for a while. Now, China researchers release a paper, academic paper, saying that it's good to go. Now, in the paper, it should outline exactly what's going on, and other uh, people who are in the space of cryptography will be able to review that paper and provide their own objective analysis of the validity of the claim. Here's the thing. They said that the paper was not peer reviewed. Peer review is when basically before you publish it, you have other people who are qualified review it and uh, either support it or debunk it or, you know, help you write it better. So there's like, you know, clear limitations pointed out or, uh, you know, factors that need to be specified on what it is and what it's not. Okay. That wasn't done, which doesn't mean it's a complete farce. It just means that there's a lower standard of of quality control being applied to the validity of the research that's being done. Finally, finally, I I, I really tinfoil hat here, okay? So like the like the ability to break RSA and decrypt traffic is such a technical advantage from an espionage perspective from a military perspective that you there's no way if your country had that capability that you would write a academic paper and publish it publicly that especially in china right so to me that reality indicates that this might be not exactly true because it's just like that's such a military advantage and, and like such a, a national advantage over other countries that that why would you disclose that? It's like having a master key to to like all the doors in a building. It, like you wouldn't tell anyone because they would all think that like, oh, if I lock something in this room, it's secure. I don't need to worry about it. And you're like, yeah, it's totally secure. But secretly, you have the key to unlock everything. It would be ridiculous if you wrote a white paper and pasted it to the front door of the building and said, by the way, Jerry has a master key to everything. Like, yeah, because then you just compromise all of the confidence everybody else would have in the security protocols and, and measures that are in place. Right. That There's no unless like there's just no advantage to it. OK, I'm not saying that the researchers work for the Chinese government, but there has been documented examples of the Chinese government reaching into the private sector, reaching into academia and influencing disclosure. So, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. The TLDR though, is that this is coming. If this is not true today, this is coming. And it, the only way to... <laughs> NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is actually working on this, but the only way to combat this is to come up with a quantum version of encryption that a quantum computer couldn't break, right? And NIST is actually working. I think they have it narrowed down to four different algorithms that use quantum computers uh, to encrypt. Uh, so going forward, we should be fine. Uh, the final thing I'll point out, that, point out though, is that anything that any data that is sent today that is captured will be put in cold storage. I guarantee you. And then when quantum computers can break that encryption, they will go back and unencrypt all that data. So everything today, it's not it's not transient. It's not vol it's not volatile. Like it can be recorded and decrypted later when the technology is in place. So be mindful of that. Thanks for listening to today's episode. We Thanks for listening to today's episode. It was a slow news day, so I don't know what to I don't know what to do about that, but you know, it is what it is. All right.
right, guys. Sounds like there was a, uh, some buffering issues. If you were here just for the news, I genuinely appreciate it. We're right there at 845. This is the part of the show where I thank you for being here and remind you that we'll be back at 8 a.m. on Monday morning. But if you're here for a little jaw jack and if you're here for a little good time, uh, stick around. We do that for a few minutes afterwards. I do want to remind everybody, since it sounds like that, um, that we were buffering at the mid-roll, the raffle prize for next week is... Uh, a full voucher to Joe Gray's OSINT using recon course right here. I've been taking this course. Um, it's been fantastic. Joe Gray is a leader in our industry around OSINT and social engineering. He literally wrote the book on practical social engineering, which I also purchased but haven't had an opportunity to read. I'll be raffling off one voucher every single day for this course on stream. Thursday will be a um, team replay raffle. You can enter that if you're live, obviously, but just team replay will have an opportunity to get into it. I'll just tell you guys, um, this tool Recon NG is very, very powerful. Um, and Joe goes through how to, how to set it up. Um, I've got it on a Raspberry Pi. He goes through all of that, modules, workstations, and now we're starting to actually use modules and do things. If I could, if I could change my screen, I, I would show you um, what I have, but it's, it's, I can't really do it easily. But I've got, I've got it up right now, and I was actually running, um, I was running Metacrawler across the Citadel, <laughs> the Citadel.edu domain to pull back stuff. So it's going to be cool. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. Whoever wins, best luck to you, and I hope you can take advantage of it. No Grayson joke of the day today. Grayson did not provide one, uh, unfortunately, but we'll be back on Monday with Callan's artwork of the day, which he's already provided to me. I'll give you a hint. This piece of art has actually been named, and it is named Cows in Tornado. That's the name of the piece of art that I'll be showing you on Monday. All right. BSEC saying that uh, there's a lot of better stories out there that we didn't get to. Uh, that's unfortunate. But yeah, we live and die by the CISO series. You know what I'm saying? All right. Thanks for being here, David Campo. C Money, um, C Money G, here's the newsletter. C Money G is first day today on the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. Hopefully, you got value out of it and enjoyed your experience. All right, Harish, uh, looks like Liam hooked Harish up with um, GRC course. Very nice. We're doing a little jaw jack, and I'll go three more minutes. Um, I'll go three more minutes. Cows and Tornado, yeah, exactly. Got the yeet. yeet. So Joel Belton's asking about the emote poll. Uh, we had discussed, I did the emoting um, yesterday and it kind of was a hot mess. So I actually was thinking like, I'll pick an emote for jaw jacking and have four options and let chat pick a jaw jacking emote. Uh, the thing is, I don't have four emotes to uh, put up right now. And I was busy yesterday with work and then the live stream and then, um, you know, some personal matters. So yeah, no, I know Chiller Instinct. I just, I don't have the four emotes to... Uh, to throw up there right now. So, Matthew Necci. Oh, my my pleasure, Matthew. Hopefully the buffering wasn't too bad. I think it was a YouTube problem, you know? Kind of live and die on the platform. Can't, can't get around that. So. <laughs> BSEC. Greg Jones, good morning. Good to see you. Liam, always always a pleasure. Again, guys, Stacy and um, Jess Bishop absolutely crushed it last night on the stream. If you, again, if you didn't see it, come check it out. Uh, there they are. It was such a good stream. Such a good stream. It was one hour, tightly packed. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. And um, we did we did a lot of it. Any thoughts on building an IT resume? Yeah, go for it. Solid. They do get into what to put on your resume uh, if you want to look be a SOC analyst in the stream. That was pretty good. I enjoyed that. Oh, Alana, you'll love that stream. It was it was excellent. Or I thought it was excellent. Have a great weekend. Be safe. 
That's right. Eric Hildebrandt, great show. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Jim Wales, thank you so much. K. Scott Powell, I hope you're feeling better. Saw that on LinkedIn, how you were banged up. Wishing you a very speedy recovery. ChatGPT is great for resumes. Um, here, here's like a fun fact. Next Wednesday, I will be streaming Threat Gen Red versus Blue, and we are going to be using ChatGPT as the CISO. Uh, Clint is actually putting all the rules and the framework of Threat Gen Red versus Blue into ChatGPT, and then we're gonna we're gonna have ChatGPT do it. Um, part two of last night's sock stream. Yeah, that'll happen in February or, or early March, Harish. Thank you, Mark Lester. Great show. I appreciate that. Paula Terranova, my pleasure. Oh, Jeremy Williams with a smart call. Copy and paste your current resume in and have ChatGPT fix it up. Smart. Any books to recommend, Gerald? Um, yeah, I mean, I got a couple, right? So if you want a cybersecurity book, This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends by Nicole Pelroth is very good. Um, I'm going to be reading Practical Social Engineering by Joe Gray next. And then, um, because I have so much going on with work, different, you know, I have, I have, I basically have two and a half full-time jobs. Um, I'm actually reading this book, Systemology, that was recommended to me by Brandon Poole on how to put systems in place uh, so you can, you know, better manage your time, but not compromise on output. The book I wrote, Aaron, um, cybersecurity... I think you mean this one. Maybe you mean this one. This one right here I wrote with Jax, Kim, and John. Yeah, this is my book. If you're interested in that. I also wrote a dissertation book, but no one wants to read that. Although somebody did email me the other day and like told me that they read the whole dissertation and liked it. Um, yeah, Sandworm's pretty good too, I've heard. Um... Yep, first 90 days would be fun. Dan Raiden, we could totally do that. Nice. All right, guys. Let me do this. That's right. All right, guys, so it's time. I'm going to spin out of here. Thank everybody for being here. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Be good to everybody. We'll see you next time. But I got to get, I'm, I'm working on my outro, okay? So thanks for being here, everybody. I hope you got value. Hit the like on the way out. And until next time, stay secure.